week, so Meg meeting. Um, I'd like to just start by noting that uh, Glenn White uh, has uh, retired from federal service, and uh, we'd like to uh, uh, thank him uh, again for all his work uh, with the Meg. And uh, this week we have two talks. Our first speaker is uh, Clint Bastini. I think so. The topic of my presentation today is just going to be this comparison two cycles of multiple high res diet. Zero Z on the 21st and 12 Z on the 21st of April. The full of convection over Oklahoma that I'll be showing. And an MCS moved across Oklahoma in the uh, morning into the afternoon. I've actually captured better in the city, which is initially I told hours prior. There's just a bit of a spoiler in this particular case. The ultimate impact was pretty anticlimactic. Since the alteration of the environment by that earlier MCS was pretty temporary, the air mass had more or less recovered at the time convection initiated later in the day. Also, uh, a synoptic front became the dominant feature for later day convection as opposed to any outflow boundary that was left behind by the earlier MCS. But nevertheless, this is a good example of convection in earlier forecasts being more accurate than convection in later forecasts. We'll start off with uh, some analyses, both of the GFS, and I'll show uh, evolution of surface boundaries throughout the day. So here are uh, 500 millibar plots of geocentral height and contours. And the elasticity relatively still, the level of scent is in the blue. And these are from the Eastern Anomaly. And so this is at 12Z on the 21st April. At this time, the MSCS is just starting to organize over Oklahoma in a shortwave trough of interest to go to Colorado. Step ahead to 18Z, that's a trough moves farther east. Then 0Z on the 22nd, this is when sort of the second round of convection was starting to initiate uh, along the Ohio and the Oklahoma Texas border. And then by 6 Z, the trough just moves farther to the east. You see most of the middle level sent in the blue countries here is now over Arkansas and Missouri. Here is a 13 Z outlook issued by SPC. So there's a slight risk. CERT has two lobes to it. So the northern lobe is capturing the threat from this early MCS, and I circled of these winter ports here were a result of the early MCS. And this second lobe uh, takes the threat that is posed by a later convection, so that was a lot of people on a tornado report just to the northwest of Dallas. So stepping through some uh, surface analyses, also the uh, observed compositive activity is going to be in the top left of all these plots, and starting at the 12Z on the 21st of April. And so what I've analyzed here, I put both a blue and a red line, because earlier in the day, it acts sort of like a warm front, later in the day, it'll act more like a cold front. At this time, it's more like a stationary boundary. I draped across southern Oklahoma. You can see two points in uh, the mid-60s and upper 60s in Texas. And then north of this boundary, air temperatures in the 50s and two points in the 50s. And what I circled here on the top left is this area of convection that will organize into an MCS the three severe winds in Oklahoma in the following hours. This is 12Z, moving ahead three hours to 15Z. You see the observed reflectivity, how that MCS has organized over central Oklahoma. Just right between the two. This boundary has moved a little bit farther to the north. You see this boundary slowly flow to the south of it. So this is uh, an update to the SPC convective outlook issue at 1630Z. And you can see the influence that ongoing convection has in the outlook site issue. They've carved out this notch into the slight risk where that MCS is located uh, at the time of the issuance of this convective outlook. And they do that with the idea that the MCS moving through is going to stabilize uh, the air and sort of decrease your chances of severe weather later in the day. Overall, it's pretty good. Check about what the enhanced area is capturing all those sphere reports pretty well. This is that same 15Z image again. 
then moving ahead to 17Z, and MCS is progressed farther to the east down in eastern Oklahoma. As far as the boundary, at this point, the synoptic boundary and apple boundary sort of been muddled together, so I just have this dashed line and see a sort of discriminator between the warmer air to the south and the cooler, rain cooled air to the north. So there at 20B, I didn't even bother analyzing the boundary at this time because it is just sort of muddled in this general area in southern Oklahoma is where our boundary would be located. You see some elevated convection over central Oklahoma, but the convection later in the day will initiate, so there's still a suppressed area along the end of the Texas and Oklahoma. I circled here uh, the Dallas location, where we showed some uh, a 20D sounding that was launched on this day to measure what instability was and what was or the prospects for severe weather. So here is a 20D sounding uh, launched at Dallas. Service based Cape was around 2,500 joules per kilogram. Uh, the wind profile looks uh, pretty good with back winds at the surface and then a westerly wind. The rock, the photograph, <coughs> doing some clockwise uh, looping. So showing some, some pretty good potential for severe weather. Here are Model soundings overlaid with that observed sounding. So the observed sounding is going to be in the magenta line, and then the observed winds are the magenta wind on the right. And then the her is the red contours of solid temperature dash D point. And the MNS is blue, again, solid temperature dash D point. Now in the files on W cost, the synoptic time for the sounding was labeled as 21Z, which you remember. We said the label is 20 B. I don't know what is most accurate, so I'm going to show the model soundings valid at both 20 and 21 B. So these are valid at 20 B. You can see that this uh, large inversion here, this capping, the observed sounding is not captured uh, perfectly by either the error or the man. That's, that's pretty typical of high resolution models. They generally don't capture um, as exaggerated as caps as you see in observations. Also worth noting that the winds are not quite as backed in both of the models that are in the MMS as they were in observations. So that was 20Z. This is 21Z. Again, winds not as backed as they were observed in the capping. So there is definitely capping in the model soundings, but not uh, as prominent as observed. Also note that uh, the MMS is quite a bit moister in the low levels right at the surface. And observed or the her. The temperature in the MS is actually very good and the her is actually a little. So moving back to our surface analyses, this is again 20Z as I showed a few slides earlier. It's a sort of unclear boundary along the Oklahoma Texas border. Now at 22Z, it's a pretty big shift in both the winds over Oklahoma uh, and in the definition of the boundary. So toggle between two, you see winds sort of uh, east northeast. And then this boundary really like, took shape in these two hours, 220 and 22 Z. And you see that convection now the the show later in the day starting to initiate uh, in southern Oklahoma. And those were um, some severe cells. So now just stepping through to zero Z, the boundary starts progressing to the south and east, and those cells uh, further develop. And here's 3Z. You can see how far the boundary is progressing now is in the adult area. Okay, so now getting into model forecasts. Here is a 0Z 21st cycle 16 hour forecast. This is valid at 16Z. The observed composite activity is shown in the center here with this well defined NCS over uh, eastern Oklahoma. The HER on the top left, doing a very good job with the location of an NCS. The high res ARW also doing a good job showing a well developed NCS. High res NMMB also doing a good job. Uh, the NAM MET, uh, not so much, shows more of a east west oriented uh, cluster of thunderstorms as opposed to that north south line NCS. But overall, zero Z guidance is doing a very good job 
capturing the convective evolution through 16Z. If you look at uh, the 12Z cycle, what program is this? 0Z21st. The initial conditions for the moment? This is a 16 hour forecast. 16 okay. So, yeah. 16 hour forecast out 16G on the 21st. Okay, thank you. And this is the 4 hour forecast from the 12Z cycle. And there's a huge difference between them. Both uh, her and uh, the man met assimilate these activity. Um, didn't really help them too much in this case. Higher windows do not do that, so they have even more struggle spinning things up. And in this four hour forecast, that MCS over Oklahoma is pretty much absent. So just probably between two. Sorry, quick comment there. The ARW and MMD, while they don't have an explicit assimilation cycle, they do use the RAP for initial conditions, which does assimilate. So not on the full scale of the high res, but there usually is some influence of the RAP assimilation there. Okay, thanks for that clarification. As far as the impacts of what that MCS has on uh, the environment, this is an 18-hour forecast from the zero Z cycle, the cycle that did capture uh, that MCS. 24 miles per NAM nest in the higher air W and MMB. You can see that there's a uh, cooled air extending all the way down to the Oklahoma Texas border. Higher than MMB, keeping the warm air farther to the north. But all of them show rain cooled air. You can compare that to the 12 C cycle that was mostly absent with a well defined NCS. You can see how different the environment is over southern Oklahoma. And so if you're trying to assess severe threat later in the day, it's, they make you think that there's more of a threat over southern Oklahoma than there otherwise would be if you had a cold pool that moved through. As far as what that means for instability, here is, again, the zero Z cycle that did capture the MCS. And that MCS ate away the cape uh, in these models of her you know, nest, ARW, and then and then the zero hour forecast from the HER in the ATV cycle is here for for your verification showing that reduced cape over southern Oklahoma. You compare that to the 12 C cycle that struggled with uh, NCS in the short range. You can see those higher values of cape over 2,000 joules per kilogram are extended farther to the north. Here's the zero Z cycle four hours later. So the last temperature plot I was showing was valid at 18 Z. These are valid at 22 Z. And in that four hours, it actually ends up being quite a bit of air mass of recovery. So if we compare the 22 hour forecast to the forecast valid at 22 Z between the zero Z and 12 Z, there is no HER valid at 22 Z for the difference from about to 18 hours. You can see despite the large differences that were there four hours earlier, the air mass was largely recovered. So in this instance, the earlier convection didn't have that much of an impact on the later uh, forecast, but uh, you can imagine in other cases, uh, that kind of thing does matter quite a bit. So looking at 24-hour uh, forecast, verification here, top left from the zero Z cycle, the all been looking pretty similar with kind of convection firing roughly the right areas on the Oklahoma-Texas border. And then the 12 Z cycle, this flight not captured in MCS very well, later in the day with the reflectivity valid at uh, 0 Z on the 22nd. It looks pretty similar to what <coughs> the 0 Z 21st cycle was showing. And again, that's because the air mass has recovered. Also, it's not the boundary uh, cycle as opposed to the output boundary. Looking at some updraft uh, helicity plots, what's plotted here is uh, this 12 hour maximum updraft helicity. This is valid at 6 V, so this is covering the period from 18 V on the 21st to 6 V on the 22nd of April. I have the convective outlook here issued 1630 by FTC with the reports overlaid. And then updraft helicity from the zero Z cycle from the NAMNAS, NMMB, and ARW. If you look uh, 
said where all of them are showing some tracks. It overlays with where the reports are actually valid. So a pretty good point. This gives you a bit of a sort of implication that there would be more severe weather in Institute Northern Oklahoma, especially in of the Man Nest, whereas if you remember from the surface plots, temperatures were in the 50s there, so that would be more elevated convection and nothing uh, too surface-based. But overall, doing a pretty good job capturing what the severe location would be. If you look at the UH tracks from the 12 week cycle, again, the cycle that struggled with that MCS, that was a precursor to from this later severe convection. They did a very good job, again, looking at the locations of all of these tracks in Texas. They paired very similar for the her and MS in both the high res windows, and they are coincident with where the severe weather was observed. So I'll just step through uh, various her initializations for a 12-hour period. So this is the HER initialized 0Z on the 21st. These are all going to be valid at the 17Z on the 21st with the observed composite reflectivity on the right. So in the 17-hour forecast, the HER was right uh, to the, down to the county pretty much that's where that MCS is located. So we're stepping through every subsequent cycle. This is now the 1Z initialization of the HER 16-hour forecast, now the 17Z. Still looking pretty good. 15 hour forecast, 14 hour forecast, 13, 12, then the 11 hour forecast here about those initialized at 60. You see it starts lagging a little bit, becoming more east cluster oriented. 10 hour forecast, 9 hour forecast, 8. That didn't start to become more disorganized. Pick up that's a bunch of multicellular of convection, think too organized. And then 12Z uh, is quite a bit different from verification. I also have a loop animated gift here that just goes through. And you see the deterioration in the MCS as your initialization time gets closer to your verification time. I don't know for sure. I do know that the just from looking at the her, it does form stratiform regions very readily. So that's a big difference between the her I've noticed in the NAM nest and the NAM nest frequently lacks the all the time share from region and the hurricane seems to overdo it. But that's just for anecdotal on my part. I don't know. Okay, so in summary, this case provides an example of the deterioration in forecasts and slides closer to verification time and do the struggles good enough in maintaining convection that's ongoing when the model uh, is initialized. So for this case, uh, ultimately, it didn't matter how much for later day convection. All the high risk did a pretty good job with that uh, a late day severe weather in southern Oklahoma and northern Texas because they're not able to recover. And the uh, south of moving south of front is what triggered the convection south of the dominated off the boundary. That's all I have. Any uh, comments in the room? Yeah, the protein and the liquid. Can you help take them up? Here on the line. Thank you. Yeah. So, I'm not, can you? Okay. Okay. So, the, the question in mind is that the Oklahoma MCS, what's the time it starts? What's the time it ends? From the observation. Right. So, it started around. Twelve Z is when it was just starting to form and really organized around fifteen Z and then seventeen Z still organized and then dissipated over Arkansas is twenty Z, so it's an eight hour period there between twelve Z and twenty Z. 
is around the five to six hour life cycle from from twelve to seventeen probably maximum eight hours maybe so to my other cousin like the from the analysis uh twenty first at tell me do I see something for the m c s you know initial data zero hour yeah initial yeah so the a big difference initial our more than initial like land compared with observation right the model definitely in just a zero hour forecast had had the m c s and just immediately in like the hour that follows it just dissipated it, so even though with the simulation it knows that the zero hour forecast that there should be reflectivity there um, just the Dynamics of the system weren't flexible enough in the model to maintain it. Because with NCS, there's probably a lot of cool, cool dynamics that are helping to maintain it, and that's something that's hard to spin up in the model to have sort of balanced calculations that are inherent in NCS propagation and maintenance. So, okay, so that's a good model adjustment, maybe, right? So, but for, um, from there, the, there, there, the, on that day, like the let me say how many hour I don't even make sure eighteen hour forecast is better than the twelve this starts. Right, eighteen hour forecast is better because the model's capable of developing those circulations um, if it's starting from a clean slate when you're trying to throw an MCS into the initial state of the model. I think it struggles with that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Any comments or questions on the line? I have one. I was curious as to why the ARW upgrade told us it looks so much smoother than the MMM members. It looked completely like, it looked like some filter was on it. What, what was the huge difference there? So even between uh, the two high res windows? Yeah, I think that was, better, was that the first image. Just one of the images that was even worse. It looked so much smoother than the others. Another, and I, I wonder if that one there. Like, what? <laughs> Look how smooth that is. Like, I believe the ARW was closer to my resolution. I don't know if that's enough to explain. That would probably explain it. Yeah. I mean, compared to the NAMNAP, it's definitely much coarser, but yeah, the difference between the two high res windows is less. So, the, the good test will be that the high res windows will both be three kilometers in the new version. So, We'll see if the updraft velocities look similar in the new version. Good thing to look at, Rich. Thanks for pointing that out. I'm going to put these in the like three and a half kilometers. Three and a half? Like, okay. Like, oh, oh. By, I got a 0.5 kilometer error on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Jeff, this is uh, Curtis. I want to thank you and Corey for uh, putting this case together. Um, I can respond to one comment about the, her reflectivity calculation. Yeah, there is a bit of a <clears throat> high bias in the um, stratiform precipitation regions. A lot of it does have to do with how we're diagnosing reflectivity there. Um, obviously, it's impossible to compare the hydrometeors to an observation. We just simply don't have that. Um, but I can say that there is a bit of a bias in the diagnostic there. And the other thing is, um, <clears throat> with the HER, uh, we have basically one hour to spin up the convective scale with the way the HER is designed currently. Uh, and so as you have this mature convective system uh, proceeding along across Oklahoma, uh, we have to do a little more and more catch up uh, as that complex, um, you know, becomes mature. Um, and we, again, each, each her cycle only has one hour to get all that um, spun up. So there is a tendency for some of these prolonged uh, or long-lived MCSs for the her to lag a bit behind the position of those features. Uh, due to that spin-up issue. And the last comment I'll make is this is a classic case of trying to reconcile information on multiple scales. You've got the radar assimilation that's trying to bring the MCS position forward, and then you get all that ray data in at 12Z, and you have to reconcile what sort of larger scale information that's bringing into the model. So I'm not shocked that the 12Z solution should suddenly change significantly from runs prior to it. Um, but <coughs> there's quite a bit of... Uh, 
different scales of information trying to be brought into the model at the same time, and that just could pose a pretty challenging problem um, for, you know, what scales of information do you want to weight uh, during the assimilation process differently. Okay. Um, are you including snow and wet and or wet gravel in your enhanced radar receptivity calculations? Yes, the attempt to account for bike banding is included in the diagnostic, and sometimes that will give us a pretty high reflectivity value. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Curtis. Uh, any sure. one last uh, comment or question? Okay, uh, thank you, Corey. Um, we'll move on. The, uh, the purpose of this talk in, in December, we gave a uh, winter forecasting tip uh, presentation that was pretty well received, and there was a request to do something similar in, in the warm season. I forget who specifically made the request. It might have been uh, Pat Spoden. Uh, for, uh, whoever it is, if you're listening, thank you, and I apologize for not remembering. Um, but the, the, the idea is going to try and point out some recent model changes and other issues that the Meg has uncovered, uncovered in past warm seasons that are relevant to the forecasting of events with significant convection. Now, the disclaimer will be that we've had a lot of upgrades on models in, in the past year and, and things are consistently um, evolving, but uh, we'll try and talk about some storylines that uh, we, we think are still relevant. Uh, well, one and two, uh, some major uh, high-res model biases have been corrected in upgrades that have occurred since the last convective season. The first one is the uh, mitigation of the warm, dry bias in the uh, RAF uh, and the HER. Uh, if you look at, uh, uh, this is back to the previous version, uh, the two-meter temperature bias with the old version, the red used to have a significant uh, warm bias, especially during the uh, late afternoon uh, hours. Uh, the new version is that is significantly reduced. And here on the bottom, where it used to have a big dry bias in the uh, afternoon hours, uh, again, the new version is uh, that is uh, reduced significantly. And that was implemented uh, this past August, so this is in place and ready to go. Here as we uh, move into the new convective season, the uh, correction there was a—I won't go through all of these—but it was a, a number of, of changes acting in concert, including data assimilation, uh, the uh, convective scheme in the wrap. The her is obviously explicit. The microphysics, the boundary layer, and the land surface model. And so, uh, whereas in previous uh, convective seasons. The instability forecast from the RAP and the HER have been pretty much unusable. Uh, the new version looks that the instability forecasts are going to be reasonable. And in, in this case from last year, you can see where the every day the RAP and the HER would completely dry out the lower levels and the resulting CAKE forecast would be way underdone, uh, not uh, nearly as much of an issue in the new version. And a great case, and besides the CAPE forecast, this also feeds back to the actual forecast of convective systems. And a great case, I'm, I'm taking slides here from the examination of the uh, July 2015 Upper Midwest uh, derecho that we looked at. And uh, in a nutshell, when you have that warm, dry bias in the previous version, you would easily mix out inversions, eliminate convective inhibition, and convection would go everywhere. With the new version, it's going to maintain uh, any kind of capping inversions and such and allow a much more realistic evolution of convection. And that's shown again with this case. The uh, top here will be the old version. The bottom is the new version that's currently in place. And this is right at the start. Uh, you can see just through the spin-up, the old version is starting to convect over a large area where the new version is uh, focused in the areas where there actually were storms. And then one hour later, the old version here goes boom. Things erupt basically everywhere, and it's not correct. Uh, again, storms here are confined to uh, west central and northwest Minnesota. There's nothing really south of there. There are lots of erroneous 
a convection in the old version and the, the new version not perfect but uh, significantly uh, improved. And that's because if you look at, at the soundings one hour in the old version, it would uh, wipe out uh, any uh, inhibition, and here you have a sounding that's almost ready to convect, whereas in the new version here for the same site, uh, you can see this is not a sounding that is ready to, uh, to generate storms. And if you look at the evolution of, of that system, again, here's the mature uh, bow echo with a lot of wind damage. The old version, because it has storms everywhere, it can't organize uh, into the actual uh, solar propagating MCS, where the new version looks uh, a lot closer to what the radar looked like. Even 14 hours later, uh, the old version is a bit of a mess. And the uh, new version, this is pretty close to uh, what the other evolution looks like. It has a uh, pretty small, strong uh, system just having gone through Chicago. Now, all that said, there is still uh, a, a bias in her, and, and really in, in most of the high risk values, they tend to run a little bit hot with uh, too much convection. If you look here at the uh, uh, skill score, the uh, new version in blue is, is an improvement for the time. More importantly, if you look at the uh, bias, uh, the, uh, the new version here in the blue, this is a significant reduction and a, a very uh, high bias for reflectivity, generating a lot of storms in the old version, and significantly reduced the time in the version that is now in place. The other big reduction is the reduction of the NAM nest wet bias. There was a uh, very significant wet bias in the NAM nest that with the upgrade that went in this past March has been significantly uh, reduced. Uh, the, the threat scores here, uh, to look at the, uh, the previous version of the NAM nest is the green, the new version is the purple. So you have a clear improvement in the uh, RMS, and excuse me, the threat scores. But more importantly, if you look at the bias, the old version here of the nest at the higher threshold had a bias that essentially went off this chart. And the new version, while still having a, a wet bias, again, as most uh, high-res models do, it is brought down significantly. If you look here at the sample case, the previous version, the um, intensity here of the maximum is a lot of five, six, seven inch plus uh, amounts scattered throughout this map that are significantly reduced in the new version. And one more uh, example, I think this is from uh, uh, Jacob uh, Carley. This is a, a case of a, a big uh, precip event in uh, May in 2015. Observed precip, previous version of the uh, NAM nest here, uh, really missing the area completely where the heaviest occurred, and the new version uh, looking a lot uh, more like what happened where they are. Not perfect by any means, but big improvement. Uh, again, and some of the reasons, there's a, a number of reasons for the uh, improvements, including microphysics, uh, but the, the use of radar reflectivity in the analysis is a big help. And the nest used to uh, basically spin up uh, kind of a cold start, and now it has a data assimilation cycle. So if you look at the uh, uh, old version and, and the new uh, one hour into the forecast, the uh, new version looks uh, a lot better. It, the, uh, the benefits of assimilating the radar reflectivity data and having an assimilation cycle lead to better uh, forecasts right off the bat. So this is something that I, I've found that a lot of our users don't know, but uh, in, in our unified post processor, we actually compute tape and skin <coughs> four different ways. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, one is surface-based, where you look the most unstable level in the lowest 10 millibars. We have a 180 millibar best tape, and here we divide the lowest 180 millibars into six 30 millibar average layers, and whichever of those six layers has the highest mean theta E, we lift that. We have a 90 millibar mixed layer tape. I talked about that we divided the lower atmosphere to those six 30 millibar average layers. We take the lowest three of those, average them, and that can, can, uh, becomes a parcel, essentially, that we lift. And then we have a 
300 millibar is best case where we have the most unstable level in the lowest 300 millibars to account for those uh, events where the uh, lifted parcels are originating well above the surface. And all of these uh, case and thin computations use a virtual temperature correction. And uh, how to view, uh, I do not believe that we have uh, all four uh, available in AWIPS from any of our models. So from the NAM, they, uh, if you want to see all four, what they look like, they are uh, available on this uh, website. Most of our, on AWIPS, most of our uh, files uh, have the surface and 180 millibar uh, best. The HER that has the surface, the 300 best, and the mixed layer. The uh, wrap on AWIPS has the surface and 300 millibar best. Now, AWIPS has a computed cape which can uh, play around with which parcels are, uh, are lifted, and they have model delivered cape, which is our stuff that's delivered right out of our models. The uh, computed cape tends to have some pretty extreme values with uh, what's uh, used as lifted uh, parcels. So, as an example, these are the uh, four cape forecasts for the same uh, case is from last week in surface, 180 millibar best, 300 millibar best in mixed layer. You can see some pretty big differences. The mixed layer is uh, lower than most, as you would expect with the mixing. We're not just lifting that uh, often high theta E surface air. Uh, and if you look here across Oklahoma, the best capes are picking up on a lot more instability than the surface or mixed layer. We look at a couple of uh, locations to see why they're different. Look, this is Ardmore in southern Oklahoma, and here's what the sounding looks like to, at that time. You can get a sense that if you're lifting here from the surface, you have very little uh, instability to work with, so the surface base case is minimal. Uh, the uh, mixed layer here by with the inversion in the low levels, you actually benefit from the mixed layer of uh, having a little bit higher uh, theta E parcel to lift, but it's still relatively small. And the, uh, the best case uh, with the ability to uh, lift from the, the 180 millibar best case is going to probably lift from an average of something in this layer here, while the 300 millibar best case is probably going to lift from something uh, up in this region. And there's clearly a lot of instability above that, which is why the 300 millibar best case is coming up the highest value there. Now let's get down here to off of the uh, Texas coast. Now you have a sounding where this is uh, what in the NAM what the uh, Steve Weiss is often uh, referred to as the ankle deep uh, boundary layer, which we see here out of the water. Very shallow, uh, moist uh, layer. So as a result, the surface base cape comes up with the uh, highest value. And the 300 millibar best case, which is looking again for the highest theta E and the lowest 300 millibars, is going to find it pretty quickly right here at the surface. Uh, the 180 millibar uh, best case, which is averaging, is going to get a, an average of those lower levels and, and won't be as high as the surface base. And the mixed layer, again, if you're looking at over the lowest 90 millibars, you can see why there's such a drop-off in case using that method. But all four of these have their purpose, and uh, it's worth pointing out what the differences are and uh, to, uh, to, to know what you're looking at and, and, and how to use them. I cannot recommend strongly enough that the uh, uh, high-resolution uh, ensemble forecast system, hrf 2 is in its evaluation period right now. There's a lot of high-res guidance out there to sort through. Uh, the hrf 2 combines the NAM nest, the high-res windows, and the nest of wharf in the means and probabilities. Uh, it does not uh, include the HER because it's mainly for that kind of 12 to 36-hour uh, uh, period. It uses the neighborhood probabilities. The, uh, the previous version uses grid point probs. The uh, need to neighborhood probs in the new version really makes for some nice looking products. This is the web page to go to if you'd like to uh, get a sneak peek here of, of what it looks like or participate in the ongoing evaluation. Uh, it's essentially, if you're familiar with the storm scale ensemble uh, of opportunity that's on the uh, SPC uh, website. Uh, we decided to essentially operationalize that with two changes. The uh, grid spacing for all members becomes very close to three kilometers. 
Uh, again, neighborhood probability replace prob uh, uh, replace the grid point for, and uh, probability, and we have probability matched means. These uh, HRS ensemble products do go to A list. When this is implemented this fall, we'll have the hourly products instead of the three hourly that are available uh, now. We're going to move the high res windows to run alongside the NAM. So this uh, HRF will be available about three hours sooner than the current SFDO is. And again, that's targeted for implementation probably around uh, October of uh, this fall. Now, HERV-E3 will be implemented uh, in, in February, and then we have hrf 3 targeted for probably in, in 2019. Uh, there's the potential to uh, add SD3 members uh, to, that, uh, to that version of HRF if they uh, show that they uh, deserve a spot there. We also have the potential to add some of the extended HER runs. In the next version of the HER, we're likely to uh, extend at least uh, a couple of the cycles each day out to 36 hours. And just uh, an example, this is from a case that we looked at uh, a few weeks ago. This is the uh, previous version of the HRF with the uh, grid point probabilities and the new version with the neighborhood uh, uh, probabilities. I have about, uh, for this case, uh, 21, 0, and 3Z, and the observed radar on the right. This is probability of uh, <laughs> activity exceeding 50 dBZs. And if you look at the uh, evolution here, the, uh, the two corridors here of uh, severe are, are captured pretty nicely uh, by this uh, HRF. Again, the SSEO uh, was, was shown last year in the CLUE experiment of the hazardous weather test bed to be very hard to beat in terms of constructing a high-res ensemble. You have a number of well-tuned uh, high-res models and, again, uh, generating probabilities from, from them seems to be a pretty good uh, approach here to figuring out how convective uh, events are going to evolve. Again, just to show the membership, uh, we have uh, high-res window, or the ARW and MMB members, the NAM nest, and essentially the Nestle Wharf, we're calling it member 2 ARW. Uh, we have a, always a current version, and then uh, either a 12-hour old member for the high-res windows or Nestle Wharf, and a six-hour-old uh, member of the NAM nest, and the old cycles get about 75% of the weight of the current cycle. Okay, here's a, a, a tip that's worth pointing out. Beware the 0Z GFS moisture spike. The two-meter dew points in the GFS tend to really spike around 0Z, so the, uh, the instability parameters then get really inflated. If you look at a snapshot at 0Z, and can give a bit of a false impression of the environment. There's, there always usually is some moistening at that time of day, but it tends to be exaggerated in the, uh, the GFS. Now, uh, Tracy Dorian had shown some cases from earlier this spring where it looked like there might be some mitigation of this issue in the GFS. From what I've seen in, in recent weeks, it appears that's not the case, but we still need to look at that a little bit uh, more closely. I mean, 21Z may be a better valid time to assess late day convective parameters in the GFS. And here's an example. These are uh, uh, GFS 2 meter dew point forecast, valid 21Z, uh, OPS GFS on top, and the new version, which is going to be implemented in roughly June uh, at the bottom. Here's three hours later, and the, uh, the, the boost in dew points here over a, a pretty large area is, is hard to miss. And then three hours later, things come back down. It's, uh, again, there always is a little bit of a boost at that time, but usually not to the magnitude that the GFS wants to do. So another thing that we've noted uh, in the meg is that, uh, and, and we found this in a number of cases, that NMMB coal pools tend to be colder than those from ARW. Now, sometimes they're too cold, but sometimes they're right. Uh, here's an example in a case from last year with the two high-risk windows. Uh, there's a convective system here moving across Oklahoma. Uh, a hint of the cold pools here in the ARW, probably not quite cold enough, while the uh, NMMB really puts the cold in, in cold pool uh, here. Uh, it's got some temperatures into the uh, upper 30s here behind this convective system, which is almost certainly uh, too cold. 
But in the uh, the, the Georgia uh, high risk day uh, a few weeks ago, we had a, some big convection moving across North Georgia and South Carolina during the morning hours, big delays at uh, Hartsfield. We looked at 21 hour two meter temperature forecast, valid 21D from a whole bunch of models. You can see on the OB there was notable cold air uh, from that from that uh, uh, convective system across North Georgia, a lot of South Carolina and Western North Carolina. And the, the models that really got the strength of the cold pool correct were all uh, NMMD. The, uh, the parent NAM, the NAM nest, and the high-res window. So in this case, the, uh, the colder cold pools that the NMMD members like to generate actually worked out fairly well. But the ARW tends to organize propagating storms better. Now, again, we really need to visit this in 2017 now that we have new versions of the high-res windows that are going to be uh, implemented this fall and with the new NAM nest that's gone in uh, in March. But in a case here from, this is actually a couple of years ago, we had a, uh, a severe convective system in the morning racing across East Texas into Western Louisiana. The uh, ARW uh, members here uh, on top uh, all had some kind of uh, organized system approaching that area, while the uh, NMMD runs were all much more disorganized and, and slower. And we uh, had a case last year with the, uh, it was the big Houston uh, flooding where uh, high-res NAM tended not to organize things. As they didn't, you know, we had the uh, convective system uh, moving across to East Texas and along the outflow boundary on its southern flank, cells trained in the Houston area caused a lot of flooding. The uh, her with the ARW was noticeably slow, but did correctly uh, organize the system. Again, just, we, in older versions here of NMMD, we, we've seen a, a lack of the ability to really organize things, especially along uh, outflow boundaries. And we'll see if that persists here in, in the new versions. Um, the models generally ran moist in the spring of last year and then really dried out later in summer, especially in the GFS. And we'll uh, have to see what this uh, season holds. But just again, look at the evolution last year and we'll keep an eye on that uh, this summer. This is soil moisture from the NAM on top, GFS on bottom, June 1st on the left and then August 1st on the right. Things were really moist across a lot of the uh, plains in Midwest uh, in the spring. And then the uh, both the NAM and GFS really dry things out on the plains, with the GFS really drying things out uh, on the plains. And as a result, in, as we went into summer last year, the northern plains really dried out in the uh, in the GFS. This is two meter dew points, uh, RMS on top and bias on the bottom. And in purple here, the GFS, you can see the introduction here of a uh, pretty significant dry bias as we went to, into summer. Same thing in the, uh, the southern plains. They were both NAM and GFS were running moist in the spring. The NAM then came down to a pretty reasonable bias in the summer while the uh, GFS went, went pretty dry. Uh, now in the Midwest, they were both extremely wet in the spring. As we went into summer, they, uh, they dried out. It was still uh, too moist. And same thing in the lower Mississippi Valley. They, uh, they both started so wet that as, as they both dried out, they were still running a bit moist by the uh, end of, of, of summer. And you can really see that here. If you look at 12-hour forecast versus OBS here in the GFS, the 12-hour uh, sounding here, the observed in the GFS uh, in solid, and the dashed uh, is the, I'm sorry, the dashed is the GFS, the observed in solid. You can see warm and noticeably dry in the GFS. What tends to happen is that we, we see a really rapid onset of deep mixing in the GFS. If you look here uh, at this case for North Platte, Nebraska, six-hour forecast, NAM and GFS, not terribly different GFS, a little bit deeper with the TDL, but three hours later, the GFS really mixes uh, things out. You get a much deeper and drier PDL. So uh, each year is different. You know, in 2015, the dry bias kicked in a lot earlier in the uh, GFS, 
And last year's DFS upgrade had some changes to mitigate this issue, and they helped to some extent. But again, later in the summer, we saw dry bias emerge on the planes. The new GFS version in June will have more changes. There's some indications of improvement. Again, I know Tracy has looked at more soundings than she ever would like to look at uh, in, in her life. Uh, and it's pointed out some cases where things are better. So this is something we'll have to uh, keep an eye on as we go uh, through the summer. Now, this uh, builds on what Corey said uh, earlier, uh, his uh, really nice look at that the Oklahoma case with the morning MCS. The question, are newer her runs better than older her runs? We get them coming in every hour. We ought to get the question, should we weight the new runs uh, a lot more? <laughs> Not necessarily. As in Corey's case, we see cases in which older runs are better if they start from a, an uncontaminated atmosphere, while the newer runs have to initialize ongoing activity and often don't do as well. If all things are equal, if you don't have a system ongoing, in my opinion, the new runs are, are usually better, uh, but some time lag waiting is usually a good idea, and that's what GSD is trying to do with their uh, hurdle, the hurt time lag ensemble, which is available on their website. So again, here's the, the case that Corey uh, showed, again, where the older, the, the cleaner run that was able to develop things from a clean slate had a much better forecast than the uh, runs that try and assimilate an ongoing system. But here's a case where uh, we didn't have morning uh, convection, at least in, in Nebraska. We had uh, mid-afternoon development <coughs> of an uh, isolated uh, major supercell in northeast Nebraska. And for this case, the newer runs correctly sniffed out the threat. And what we had with that storm is this was a famous uh, twin tornado supercell in uh, northeast uh, Nebraska. And in this case here, I have 14, 15, 16, 17 the her cycles, and if you look at northeast Nebraska, the earliest cycles don't have it. But as you get closer to event uh, to the event, the newer runs you know, with uh, the newer uh, measure scale details to the environment there snipped out almost to the county where a major supercell uh, would evolve in northeast Nebraska with a few hours of lead time. Now, uh, this uh, tip is, is that. Uh, for events where morning convection may influence instability later in the day, the high-res guidance really needs to be looked at to, uh, if you want to assess the instability. The model, the, the coarser models that have convective schemes generally can't generate the correct cold pool, and they're going to have way too much instability in areas where it's been wiped out. And the stress-severe parameters are less useful on these days because its members also are not going to have the cold pools uh, that need to be there, and they'll show much bigger threat to, over a larger area. And the case here to show, uh, and this goes back to the uh, high-risk day in, uh, in Georgia a few weeks ago, where we had, again, that morning system really wiped out the case over much of Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina uh, during the afternoon hours. This is the analysis uh, from the wrap. The 21-hour NAM and GFS uh, forecast, the, the parent NAM had a little bit of a hint that case would be wiped out here in northeast Georgia, northern South Carolina, but way overdone with the instability. So this region, GFS2, uh, showing a significantly unstable atmosphere over a large area where it didn't happen. The NAM nest, again, which is going to have the explicit convection, which can generate the cold pool, it's 21-hour uh, surface tape forecast looks significantly better. It's still a bit overdone here in south central Georgia, but this is much better at showing that uh, a large part of Georgia and South Carolina are going to have their instability wiped out by whatever happens in the morning. And again, here's just to show with the SHREP. The SHREP 12 hour forecast for that case, this is the uh, SIG tour, the probability of the SIG tour, I'm sorry, this is the mean of SIG tour parameter showing uh, a large area with a significant uh, threat of high SIG toward values much further north than uh, they occurred. And finally, uh, my last item here is a bit of a philosophical one. It uh, raises the issue of, of using parameters to forecast versus explicit hand guidance. And 
there's a growing set of cases in which parameters for a potential significant severe event look really good, but the explicit signatures in the CAMs are, are modest. The event ends up actually being low end. So the question is, how much do we trust the CAMs to discern when something really isn't right, even though the parameters themselves look pretty healthy? And here's a, a case. This is the uh, North uh, Florida high-risk uh, day back in January. And the stress parameters here show it's the probability of SIG tour exceeding five and a very high probabilities across a lot of North uh, Florida. High risk uh, issued across that area with very high uh, probabilities of significant uh, tornadoes. And if you look at the reports here, there was one pretty long track tornado across South uh, Georgia. Most of North Central Florida were pretty much void of tornadoes. If you look here, this is one of the uh, her updraft felicity forecast during uh, the day. And overall, it's up to the signatures for this area are not particularly impressive. Its best updraft felicity signature is up here across uh, south central uh, Georgia, where uh, somewhat close to where there was the big long track uh, event. But even though the parameters look really good on this day, uh, the first is not going to be a uh, big uh, uh, long track supercells with potential big tornadoes. Here's another her cycle here. This is does not scream long track big tornadoes. Whereas uh, earlier uh, in the overnight period, there had been a couple of long track killer tornadoes in South Georgia. This is what updraft felicity tracks look like in that event, and uh, a big difference. So the the cams on this day uh, they gave a signal that something wasn't quite right for a big event, even though the parameters seemed to uh, support it. So and I, I'm not saying at all that we should put full trust uh, in the uh, explicit details of the cams, but I <coughs> towards the day where we can weight them uh, a lot more, and certainly on days when the CAM signals in receptivity or updraft felicity don't seem to match up with what the parameters suggest, I think it's worth at least raising a few red flags about exactly uh, what's going to happen. And I'll finish here with some final thoughts. Uh, there are some things I didn't include here. There, there are indications that the NAM, and especially the NEST, tend to destabilize too quickly behind morning convective complexes. I want to take a closer look at that uh, this uh, warm season. Last year in the east, the NAM tended to be too unstable, while the GFS showed too little instability. The NAM tended to go gung ho the lap streets while the GFS was underdone. The new version of the NAM seems to be better. Uh, we'll take a look at both the new versions of the NAM and GFS. This uh, summer, <coughs> Look, there's a tendency for all guidance to mix the dry line too far east during the day. Uh, we'll look at that here as we get into uh, the warm season. And again, uh, we have new versions of the NAM just implemented, the GFS coming soon. New version of RAP curve was implemented last August. A new version will be in parallel in a few months. New version of high risk windows in parallel. So all these things we've pointed out are, are always in a bit of a state uh, of flux. But uh, hopefully uh, some of the things we've shown here today uh, will be useful. And I'll stop there and take any comments or questions. Any comments or questions on the line? Hey Jeff, this is Curtis again. Thanks for putting a lot of this information together. I wanted to make one comment about the um, her uh, reflectivity bias in those first two forecast hours. That is a point of emphasis in the next version of the HER, HER version 3, um, we've actually reduced a bit of the forcing from the parent RAP data, uh, radar data simulation uh, that's helping to further knock back a bit of that high reflectivity bias in the first couple of hours or sort of over initiating convection um, <clears throat> again in the first you know, four hours or so. So that's something we're further reducing for this next upgrade. Uh, I guess the other comment, um, almost more of a point of curiosity, you showed those four different types of CAPE calculations, <laughs> and there's obviously surface-based CAPE, which has obvious applications for discriminating, you know, surface-based versus elevated uh, convective processes, um, the mixed-layer CAPE for 
you know, obviously coming up with a better estimate of representativeness of instability as the diurnal cycle or the daytime cycle evolves. Then sort of the upper bound, the most unstable cape, which is your 300 best, um, so the most extreme scenario of uh, instability. But what I struggle with a little bit in terms of its applicability is the what they call the most unstable layer cape, that 180 best, as you've labeled it. I'm curious to know from you or other uh, participants uh, if they find that most unstable layer cape field to be uh, of use in their forecasts. I just want to try to get a handle on how they leverage uh, that formulation as opposed to the other three, which I'm very familiar with and completely understand how those would be used. Sure. I'll, but before I open it up for, for comments on that, I'll just say that the, the main reason the 180 millibar best cape is in there is legacy. Uh, okay. That was there before, back going back to the early 90s. And it, it was an attempt to, uh, to account for uh, again, days where the instability is based uh, above the surface, it it, it has its flaws uh, in that you know you're averaging over these 30 millibar uh, layers. I personally think the 300 millibar best case that's something I put into the post a number of years ago because we were, we were missing layer uh, events in the plains where the instability uh, the parcels originate from say 700 millibars. We were missing those, so I added in the 300 millibar best case. Mm -hmm. In a perfect world, I would like to dump 180 millibar best case, but again, legacy makes it almost impossibility uh, to do that. Uh, but if anyone would, would like to comment on the that they like that field uh, or such, given that we don't have the 300 millibar best case in AWIPS in most of our uh, models, it's the best thing to look at. But if anyone would like to comment on that, please do. So uh, I'm gonna I'll, I'll take the bait. A lot of the guidance we get in the grid format comes comes to you guys that we have the 180 best and the Kate 180 underscore zero MB in the grid file. And we just had an event like on Monday, for example. And in the, in the cooler times of the year, the surface based cake usually looks useless here. But that when you start using these mixed layer cakes like the 180 best, as you call it, you see a signal. And we just we work out the case study for the event we had here, the widespread zero event we had on Monday. And the surface based cape was almost useless, but the 180 you know, best actually just showed a signal. And uh, the 300 best actually showed a good signal, too. So, But it's only in, like, I think it's your, your her output. That's about it. It's not in all the output yet. So um, the cape that you provide, the surface based cape, in places where you don't get a lot of surface based cape in the cool season, isn't as useful as the other values. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. I, mean, yeah, it's, I guess it's. Now it's the reality is setting in for me that I didn't realize the 300 best was not accessible from a lot of the guidance, and so that's that's the piece of information that now I understand uh, why the 180 best is is still out, out there in a lot of places because it seems to me that you know, 300 best would be a good thing to supplant the 180. Yeah, it would be curious again. It, it with legacy issues, I, I believe that all four are in a number of the NAM output grids. Uh, I don't think that's true for the GFS. I'm not sure about the wrap, um, but it's something to think about. You know, with FB3, well, I, I don't want to go too much here in the future, but it's something that we should probably take a look at again with products down the line. Any other comments or questions? I should get back. Is the, so is the 300 best based upon the most unstable layer, not based upon um, a thick and averaging of layers? That's right. It's, so it's a model layer? Model layer, yeah. Actually, I thought 300 best was a parcel-based calculation. The 180s, the one you described where you have, you break it up into those 30 millibar chunks. But I thought 300 best was finding the most unstable parcel level. Right, like it, it, it's it's levels, right? If you want to call right. it, especially it's a, it goes through layers, you know, one to fifty uh, in in the AM or sixty. I'm How are we using model level and model layer? Yeah, I, think, I, think, I think we're using layer and level interchangeably. And then, and then okay, the, I got you. Yeah. But it is, there's in the three hundred best. There's no averaging. It's, right. it's level by level. Picks the one with the highest theta e lift set. Whereas the one eighty is average. It's and dividing the atmosphere and. The, Six thirty millibar 
deep average layers, and whichever of those six has the highest theta E, it's listed. So 300 will always be more unstable than 180. Greater than or equal to 180. Should be, yes. Exactly, and that's why I think the 300 is your upper bound on the instability, and that's why I think that's a nice one to have. Yeah, which is why we have that in the HER. Uh, yeah. We didn't have legacy issues there. I hope you later to the other model that people can pull the grid file on. <laughs> Indeed. Okay, uh, before we wrap up, last chance for a comment or question. You get to share the, this PowerPoint, right? Absolutely. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone.